Okay, I think we'll get going to save everyone uh, time. I'm Dr. Barry Kogan. I'm a pediatrologist uh, currently at Albany Medical College, but my background, I've a long background through Northwestern, University of Michigan, Liverpool, England, and UC San Francisco itself before uh, coming out to Albany. Um, I uh, will tell you that I tend to um, get bored during lectures. I know you've had a lot of lectures, so I've specifically designed this presentation to be more interactive, um, to keep your involvement going. And I'm gonna ask questions as we go along, and I would appreciate if you would, uh, when I ask the questions, maybe put some responses in the chat box. Uh, whether they're right or wrong, you can do them anonymously. No one's gonna be uh, held to their response, uh, but it'll help me. So this is gonna be a series of cases that I've run across. Many of them have been seen, at least in follow-up recently, um, so they're kind of fun. So this is gonna be a, a case-based um, pediatric uroradiology uh, format. And um, let's see if I can advance here. Hmm. There we go. So um, no conflict of interest on any of these, unfortunately. No pharmaceutical companies helping me with this. Um, and I'll show you this uh, case. We're gonna look at some babies with uh, distended abdomens as we start with. So this is the first case. It's a uh, two month old with an abdominal mass. Obviously it's a KUB. If you wanna put in the chat box um, what you think it is, or at least what organ systems it might be, uh, that would be nice. Anyone want to take a chance at that? I'll give you a clue. Differential diagnosis of a newborn abdominal mass. What sort of things do you look for? Either you're afraid to respond or the chat box is, there we go. Okay, renal, sounds good. Great, thank you. Thank you for taking some chances there. So here's what I find in the literature. Uh, about 50% of abdominal masses are related to the kidney, probably more like 60 to 65. Hydronephrosis being the major one. Uh, in days before ultrasound, uh, multicystic dysplastic kidneys were number two, and then occasionally some other things. GI, polydocal cysts, or duplication cysts account for some of these. Adrenal hemorrhage or neuroblastoma is brought up. And then of course it can also be pelvic masses. Okay, so having told you that it's most likely renal and this is a urology talk, this is the same patient, the uh, plain film of the abdomen and uh, a very ancient DMSA scan. What would you say your diagnosis is? Please try and put something in the chat box. Tell me what you think the diagnosis is in this case of a two month old with abdominal vas. You can see the ground glass appearance, the bowel is pushed way up here. Um, there's a little bowel down here, there's bowel here. Um, okay, renal mass, definitely. But what about this DMSA? You see parenchyma is pushed around to the side, parenchyma is pushed around to the side here. Any thoughts based on that DMSA on what the diagnosis could be? Okay, so I'm gonna show you this now. This is the retrograde pilogram. So this is the left ureter injecting, and this is an enormous UPJ obstruction of the left kidney. And this is the right retrograde pilogram, and it's hard to see the collecting system here because of all this, but there's also a smaller UPJ obstruction there. And I wanna see if I can go back. So if you look at this, this is what a UPJ obstruction looks like on a DMSA scan, a mild case where there's central hydronephrosis but preserved parenchyma, and a more severe case where the parenchyma is pushed right around the edge and you have this enormous, well in this case we know it, it extends all the way across the midline, a normal renal pelvis. So I hope you can see that on this one. Um, so you have the bilateral UPJ obstruction in this neonate, and we know that about 10% of UPJ obstructions are in fact uh, bilateral, and this uh, child did have that. Okay, 
So we'll go on to another baby with an abdominal mass. This was a newborn that we saw, 36 week gestation. Um, looked at her perineum, was very abnormal, um, swollen, enlarged, um, not really normal anatomy at all. This is her plain film of the abdomen. What sort of, um, give me a couple potential diagnoses that you might have here. Okay, yep, could, uh, CITES I see is one of the things in the chat box, could be, yep. Anything else? Like the other case, you can see the bowel is pushed way off here, no question. Very ground glass appearance. Anyone wanna take a chance? I'll give you, see what I can do here. So I like to say, think of pelvic in this case. And if you like uh, hints, I put in another hint there. Okay, anyone want to take a guess thinking pelvic? What sort of things cause pelvic masses? Give you a second to think about this. Because the idea of this is uh, I want you to look at these films and put together your differential diagnosis, think about what the options are. So I'll show you this. This is the ultrasound. You can see there's some hydronephrosis of the right kidney some hydro of the left kidney. Then we're looking down here, here's the bladder. There's fluid behind the bladder. Here's another picture with fluid here. And then the fluid from this abdominal mass is extending all the way up to the liver, separate from the kidney. Right, so I would, uh, good guess. Michael, thank you for guessing. And exactly right, and if I advance here, you can see this is the bladder, this is the vagina behind the bladder, very distended. You can see here the vagina extending up into the uterus. You can see how thick walled the uterus so it doesn't distend as much. And I'm not sure if this is uterus or fallopian tube or whatever, but it's fluid filled all the way up to, and maybe even be part of the vagina that's distended up there since it's more distensible. Um, so this is the cystogram, and you'll notice that when the Radiologists did the cystogram, they put a catheter in, it went right into the vagina. So here's a retrograde injection into the vagina. You see the uterus outlined up here, the center of the uterus outlined. And then when they put a second catheter in, it went into the rectum, so you could see it here. And then finally, a third catheter went into the bladder here. So here's vagina, uh, filling of the central part of the uterus and the uh, bladder. So diagnosis, and we'll want to take a chance of the diagnosis. Limited risk. Someone take a guess. Even my own residents are allowed to guess if they're on the call. No one. Okay, well, so this is a cloacal anomaly. This, this child has a cloaca and has a hydrocopa. So what does that mean? Oh, by the way, she, the treatment for this, she underwent acutely a vaginostomy, just like a, um, a vesicostomy, but it was the vagina in this case. And you can see uh, within a few months that completely normalized the kidneys and um, the bladder was still somewhat distended. Um, but she underwent a vaginostomy and a diverting colostomy, and then uh, later a reconstruction. So a cloaca means that both the bladder, the genital system, and the bowel all go through one common entry. Birds, the reason I show the picture of the birds is because birds normally have a cloaca, humans obviously don't. Um, and so birds, cloaca is a normal finding. That's why you really don't want to be under a bird when they're going to the bathroom, as you all know. But this is a cloacal anomaly. That's what this girl had. She, uh, after her diversion, she underwent a reconstruction. She, I saw her just yesterday. She's healthy and active. Um, she voids by straining primarily. I think she probably does have a neurogenic bladder. She has mild stress incontinence. 
She has normal kidneys, a PVR around 30, and no urinary tract infections. And she does have some constipation, but she's continent. So that ground glass appearance could be due to a UPJ obstruction, as we showed. And um, as I showed on the, on, in this case, it could be due to a cloacal anomaly with a hydrocolpus. Okay. So here's a third baby. Uh, this was a two-month-old with sepsis. Some of you in the Northeast know this case, I suppose. So um, let others guess. Uh, anyone want to say what the diagnosis is here? This is a little different bowel configuration. You certainly see the ground glass appearance, but rather than the bowel be pushed up or to the side or down, this seems to be the bowel is pushed to the center. What might that indicate in this um, newborn baby? Or two month old, sorry. Okay. Any other thoughts? What can that be? So I think this is a case of ascites. So there's so much ascites that it, it localizes laterally and pushes the bowel to the center in this case. Okay, now I'm going to ask you, okay, what's the differential diagnosis of neonatal ascites? Kind of like the other, just tell me organ systems if you want. What organ systems can cause neonatal ascites? Of course, urinary is the primary one. Bowel uh, problems are secondary, cardiac problems, and occasionally liver problems. And chylus would be very rare in an infant, but can happen. Okay, urinary ascites then, what, what would cause, since it's gonna be the, we're, it's a urology talk, and um, we're gonna focus on urinary. Um, what things cause urinary ascites in a newborn baby? Right, valves for sure is gonna be your number one thing. And interestingly, less so nowadays when people are a bit more careful, but umbilical artery catheterization, remember the umbilical artery goes right next to the bladder. And it, at least in my day as a resident, it was not unusual that the bladder would be perforated while placing an umbilical artery catheter in. So you might well get um, intraperitoneal urinary ascites from trying to place an umbilical artery catheter, okay? Best treatment, how would you treat this patient with sepsis and urinary ascites? Anyone type something in the chat box? Urethral catheter, absolutely. Yeah, now I, I think urethral catheter is absolutely the way to go. Uh, I put SP tube as a question mark and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. And yes, uh, percutaneous drainage would be like an SP tube. And there may be some theoretical advantages from a scientific standpoint to SP2, but most all of us in a sick baby like this would just slip a urethral catheter in. Okay, here was the ultrasound in that baby I just showed you. And you can see here is the right kidney with marked hydronephrosis. And you can see uh, it's retroperitoneal, but in the peritoneum is all this urine, right? Here is the left kidney, marked hydro. Here's the bladder, very thickened, abnormal uh, bladder. Now, um, I have a little side question here. Can you tell renal function on a renal ultrasound? Um, just say, if you, if you would type in yes or no, uh, give me your thoughts on, can you tell renal function on a renal ultrasound? No, okay. Anyone else? Some yes, some no. Okay, good. I like it. So obviously, ultrasound in no way is a functional test. No question. On the other hand, if I look at this ultrasound with very thin parenchyma, but I see cortical medullary differentiation here and here, and I look at this one, maybe not the best example, but I'm seeing parenchyma and some cortical medullary differentiation, perhaps here and here. Um, and I'm not seeing very echogenic kidneys. I'm not seeing cortical cysts. Um, I think you can probably tell that this child ultimately is gonna have a good renal outcome. 
So it's a bit iffy and absolutely it's not. So that was a trick question. It's not a functional test at all, but I do think you can predict renal function um, from a good quality ultrasound. Okay, so here is the VCUG on this same patient. Okay, anyone wanna tell me the diagnosis? If you say reflux, you get partial credit. Anyone feel free to chip in with the diagnosis here in the chat box? Agreed, posterior urethral valves. And this is a fairly classic appearance of the posterior urethra. Notice you've got the bladder up here, you have the bladder and neck here, a very elongated, it's a very long prostatic urethra. It's a very widened prostatic urethra. And notice that the lower end of it is kind of sail shaped. I think that's the best way to identify that. And I'll show you why later. Here's a couple of examples. Here's, notice the sail shaped configuration, the very elongated prostatic urethra in a baby. Here's another one, a different patient totally, but notice how elongated it is, widened it is. Here's maybe the normal caliber urethra, and you can see how wide it is, as well as that rounded configuration. Now, if you look at this one here, you can see obviously a very different configuration of what we like to call neonatal voiding dysfunction, where these babies, normal babies, void with very high pressures and um, uh, probably a dyssynergic sphincter for a while. Okay, so oftentimes um, while the attendings are sleeping at night, they'll ask uh, one of the residents to go put a catheter in one of these sick babies. And sometimes it's not easy. So why do you suppose it's hard to put a catheter in, in a baby with urethral valves? And I think some of you think maybe it's narrowed here, but in fact, a catheter goes through the valves very, very easily through here. But I think where the problem comes in is you have a relatively narrow bladder neck. It's not narrow. This is probably normal caliber, but given how distended the posterior urethra is in this baby, the catheter goes in here and is likely to bounce off of here or here or somewhere and not really find its way uh, through the bladder neck. So really important, what are a couple of tricks you can use? I think a firmer catheter is better. So you don't want to go smaller. You try, if the baby's a normal size, I would try with an eight French um, catheter, or um, I would try not to use a five. I think those are too flimsy and they'll twist and turn in here and get lost. You can try a, an eight French coudé because as I mentioned, most of the time you're going to be hit, hitting this back wall of the posterior urethra. You would not want to use a balloon catheter for several reasons. The major one is that these bladders tend to be very, very overactive and they'll clamp down on your balloon. And there have been cases reported of anuria uh, related to um, severe spasm on the balloon catheter. Secondly, the interior lumen of a balloon catheter is much smaller because there has to be a channel for the balloon. And so the interior lumen is smaller. So you tend to, we tend to use a feeding tube. And of course, the bat, as I mentioned, the bladder neck is the problem. Well, well done. And um, yes, there is bladder neck hypertrophy, if you will. But I really think it's, it's really probably a normal caliber bladder neck. It just looks small in relationship to this. There's a whole literature from 50, 60 years ago where people would do bladder neck resections in patients with urethral valves because they thought the bladder neck was the problem. But I really don't think um, that's relevant in most cases of uh, posterior urethral valves. Okay, so that's the problem, I think. Okay, this goes back to Hugh Hampton Young. He's a, uh, over 100 years ago, he described the first cases of urethral valves and he described type one, type two, and type three. Type one being coming from distal to the viru, type two going back towards the bladder and neck, leaky colliculi, and type three being more of a membrane. And you can see the various uh, pictures that way. So um, 
it turns out he was probably wrong. It wasn't his fault. He didn't have cystograms. He didn't have radiology. He didn't have the kind of cystoscopes we had. It was very primitive. And uh, it would have been almost impossible for him to make an accurate diagnosis of, of valves. So tell me what you guys think. What percentage or what percentage of valves are type one, would you say? Give me your thought based on your clinical experience. I'll give you a hint, type two is almost non-existent, probably doesn't really exist as an obstructing valve. It's an anatomic structure, but probably not obstructing. So it's gonna be type one or type three. So um, I see 60% type one, 80% type one. So that is exactly 100% correct and based on what I thought when I was a resident and what I thought until about five years ago. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes that I really think it's probably more accurate that the great majority are type three. And I'll explain why in a little bit, but I didn't know that as well until a few years ago. Um, another quick question here, what sign is used to diagnose urethral valves in utero? So this is a prenatal ultrasound. This is a fetal ultrasound. This is the urinary bladder. Now I didn't spell this wrong, this is radiopedia. I will take credit for stealing their image, but I didn't spell it wrong. But this is a radiopedia image of the bladder. Correct, keyhole sign. Very commonly shows up on exams all the time. This is called a keyhole. Of course, they use different keys in the old days than we use now. But the kind of key that uh, they're thinking of is the keyhole sign here, which is of um, urethral valves in utero. This is not my image, but this is how I like to resect them. I use a right angle electrode. And here is uh, the valve, I think, hard for me to tell in this image. Here's the Vero, I think. So they're going about five o'clock and totally disrupting this membrane here at five o'clock. You can see it's not particularly thick, it's fairly thin and fairly easy to, with um, a cutting current, very easily cuts through like butter very easy to disrupt it. And I would tend to do five o'clock and seven o'clock. There's some controversy. I actually like to do 12 o'clock as well. And I would do 12 o'clock first because once you disrupt the valve, it's a bit like disrupting a sail. The whole thing gets kind of flimsy. And down here, it's held together by the Viru. So if I do 12 o'clock to disrupt it first, then I can come back by the Viru and get these leaflets of the valve on either side. Okay, now, this guy, Patty Dewan, did something really brilliant, and I don't know if it's because he couldn't get residents or nurses to catheterize his patients, but he wound up putting SP tubes in all the patients with urethral valves, and rather than putting urethral catheters in. And what he found when he came back and did cystograms and then endoscopy on them was that these, that he described what he called copum, and general obstruction of the posterior urethral membrane. And so what he found was that he actually had membranes in almost all the cases that he put SP tubes in. And so what I think, here's what he calls the copum, what I think is happening when we would catheterize these patients and put a catheter through here, it basically tore the copum into two halves, uh, a left half and a right half, and it made us think that we had urethral valves coming from the vero on this side and coming from the vero on this side. But I think by passing a catheter through here, we kind of tore the center part of it and we created with our own doing um, type one valves when in most cases they were really type three valves. So Patty Dewan did us a favor. Now I don't know that you need to do an SP tube in all cases just to prove that point. But um, by doing an SP tube, that was their uh, position um, in Australia at the time, um, he, he made this great discovery. Okay, so this is um, a picture of this ultrasound on this baby, six weeks after catheter drainage followed by valve ablation. So I think you can see here is the right kidney, pretty significant hydronephrosis. Here's the left kidney, pretty significant hydronephrosis. The ascites, of course, is gone. Here's the bladder somewhat distended, thickened, bilateral ureters behind the bladder. What would you do at this stage? 
any suggestions from management. He's six weeks uh, post his valve ablation. We would do a cystogram. We'll say a cystogram shows his urethra is open. That would be a good point. You should make sure that you actually did the valve ablation. Yep, someone said VCUG, and I agree. That would be, that would be important here. But let's say we did the VCUG. He voids with a good stream. The valves are ablated. Um, what should we do now? I think this is a good clinical question, right? So uh, I agree with Tom, thank you. The best thing to do is nothing because these things are so deformed, it takes years for them to recover. So we don't wanna rush in and do anything. You don't have to do a vesicostomy. You don't have to do um, high diversions. You don't have to do your reuterostomies. Um, patience is the best thing to do. Provided he's voiding with a good stream, he's uninfected, the best thing to do is um, just observation. Split function tests can be done, certainly, but initially, I think, we tend to follow these babies with ultrasound. So I'll just a couple of side questions since we're on valves. Prognostic factors. Tell me what you think are some of the most important prognostic factors in urethral valve patients. So respiratory status, absolutely. A newborn period, if they have uh, pulmonary hypoplasia, obviously that's a very bad sign, no question. Nadir creatinine and is uh, a couple times, and I think that's probably the number one thing. I will go through a couple things. I think ultrasound, as I tried to point out, is one prognostic factor. If you see good parenchyma with cortical medullary differentiation, I think you're gonna be okay long-term. Uh, Secondly, the nadir creatinine that's been reported in the literature is probably the number one simple test. Nadir means how low it goes with time, and some people look at it at one year of age. But if it's below one, usually below 0.9, then you have a good prognosis. I will say, even though that's a good prognosis, that stinks because a creatinine of 0.9 in a several month old baby is the equivalent of three times normal be a serum creatinine of one of 3.0 in an adult. So even though that's a relatively good prognosis, it's still not very good. Reflux is also an important prognostic factor. Um, if you have bilateral reflux on your initial um, cystogram, and someone pointed put it out uh, dysplastic kidney syndrome, if you have bilateral reflux on your initial cystogram, that's a poor prognostic sign. And even worse is, if you do a repeat cystogram after ablating the valve six weeks later, if the reflux has not spontaneously resolved, that's a terrible prognostic sign. So those people are going to wind up in renal failure, and that's going to be a problem. And finally, incontinence, because that relates to the bladder function, uh, can also be a prognostic indicator. And those who have on, on, ongoing incontinence as they're getting older, um, they have a much worse renal prognosis. Bladder function, we know that these, you, I showed you the images, these are very overactive, high pressure bladders. It's not really a problem so much in the babies where they're just voiding into a diaper whenever they want to, but when they get to be potty training age, if they, continue, if they don't remodel their bladder, if they continue to have high pressures and poor compliance, they're likely gonna have problems. And with potty training, as you know, uh, high pressure is bad. Uh, it's gonna, and if they're being told, hold it, hold it, hold it, then their, uh, their compliance becomes a factor in the resolution of their hydronephrosis, and it's a poor prognostic sign. So bladder management, the so-called valve bladder, is key to long-term renal function, something very important. And then I'll point out that studies have shown that as the kids get older, they tend to progress, now each kid is an individual, of course, but they tend to progress from high pressure, poorly compliant bladders into large capacity bladders with myogenic failure. So it makes a huge difference how their bladder is functioning, and it's very, very important for their renal function, long-term renal function, to manage their bladder as well. Long-term outcomes, high, high rate of renal insufficiency, 
Of course, many patients don't even survive the newborn period if they have really bad valves and they have uh, uh, pulmonary hypoplasia when they're born, uh, they may not survive. But those that survive, um, there's at least a 25%, maybe up to 50%, depending on how long you follow them, rate of renal insufficiency developing. And again, that depends on uh, a lot of these prognostic factors in the beginning and then management of their valve bladder after that. This is the reason I showed this case is because he came in to see me a couple weeks ago. And these, this is his kidneys at 12 years of age. Here's his right kidney. Here is his left kidney. You can see amazing <coughs> return to normal. You can still see the very dilated, <coughs> excuse me, residual calyces here, and even a little bit of that here, but marked improvement, normal renal function. This is his bladder. And he has a, a very large bladder. I think he had four or 500 cc's in his bladder. He voided it down to about 100 or 200. And he needs to be on timed, frequent voiding. And like many of the valve patients, um, they get these big descendants of bladders. I, I meant to mention, why, why do they get these large bladders with myogenic failure? And it's partly because they have poor concentration. So remember, the distal nephron is affected first by obstruction and that's where you concentrate most of your urine. So a lot of valve patients make very large volumes of urine and get over time uh, myogenic failure. Okay, so this is a totally different patient but it makes another point in a valve patient. So this is a urethral valve patient six months after a resection of his valves. And I'll take you through this. This is a very old renogram. This is the injection of the radioisotope. This is the, these are five minutes. So this is five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, which where the diuretic was given in this case, then 20, 25, uh, 30, 35, 40, 45, et cetera. So um, what diagnosis would you come up with in this case? Anyone wanna come up with a diagnosis? I'll do it this way. What syndrome? Give you a hint. Put in what syndrome you think this patient has. Anyone? Even one of my own residents can put in what syndrome this patient has. Look at the time. It's 1.42, so we got to make sure we do this. We all, we're through a half hour. I don't want to keep you late. Someone has to put in, take a guess, what syndrome? Let me do it this way then. Okay, let's look at this again. So on the five minute study, you could see there's almost no function in this left kidney. Here's the right kidney, looks good, right? There's a different patient, but there's no function in that left kidney. Okay, the diuretic is given. The right kidney is draining into the bladder. Okay, as the bladder fills, now this patient obviously didn't have a catheter and this is a really old time, and someone put in reflux to the contralateral kidney on voiding, right. So now it looks like there's function, but there really isn't function, of course, it's the reflux. So who wants to tell me what syndrome now with all, this, with all these hints? Someone tell me the syndrome, anyone? What syndrome? Um, does this represent? Going once. Going twice. Okay, I'll tell you. This is VERD syndrome. Valves, unilateral reflux, and dysplasia. So what it means is when you have reflux in these valve patients on one side, and this is debatable, but I believe it acts as a pop-up. So it completely wipes out this one kidney. But by doing that, with the massive reflux to that one kidney, it relieves the pressure from the good kidney, and it actually preserves the function of the good kidney. So it's valves, unilateral reflux and dysplasia. It's called VERD syndrome. It's very common in the valve literature. And it's something you probably should know about. 
Um, there is some debate, there have been one or two papers recently that Verd syndrome is not that protective, but every patient I've seen that has this unilateral reflux and dysplasia has done well uh, long term. So I think it's a good thing. If, you, if you're going to have valves, it's probably a good thing to have. Okay, I want to switch gears totally and talk about another neonate. This one, for a change, didn't have a distended abdomen. Okay, here's the right kidney on the ultrasound. Here is the, another view of the right kidney on the ultrasound. And here's the left kidney. I'll point out this is the nice cortical medullary differentiation. Even though it's not a functional test, I'll tell you this is a good kidney. I can promise you that. What diagnosis do you guys think this patient would have? Right. Multicystic dysplastic. I agree totally. So even though I mentioned it's not functional, this is a well-functioning good kidney. I guarantee it. This is a dysplastic kidney without parenchyma. Very, whatever parenchyma is there is very, very echogenic. These cysts don't really coordinate. They're not central. It's not a hydronephrosis at all. This is a multicystic dysplastic kidney. Good diagnosis. What should we do for this patient? Okay, I like, Hannah, thank you, I like that. I like that, good, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, nephrology consult, I'm not sure I agree. So what further workup is necessary? Is a further workup necessary? So I'm gonna skip ahead, do we do an ultrasound? Say yes or no if you would follow this patient with periodic ultrasounds. Okay, maybe VCUG because the contralateral kidney has a 10 to 20% rate of contralateral reflux, agreed. Although it turns out very, very, very rare urinary infections in these patients. So even if you diagnose contralateral reflux, you think it should be important, it just doesn't seem to be a problem. Okay, follow up ultrasound, anyone? In my mind, not necessary, won't really have anything to do with it. Um, DMSA scan, um, what do you think of that? Only if you're not sure if this is truly a dysplastic kidney. If the ultrasound was unclear and it may be a UPJ, then you can get a DMSA scan to see if there's any function in this kidney. But when I look at this ultrasound, I don't think there's any question of that. Um, but follow-up is needed. Here's my opinion. Blood pressure monitoring, very rare cases, maybe up to 2%. Hypertension, urinalysis to look for proteinuria over time. And uh, we usually, the AAP, AAP recommendations, and they're a little outdated, would recommend no contact sports uh, for these patients. So I'm not sure that's right, but that's what they have uh, in the literature. We do, I think, um, last time I presented something like this, people brought up that you really only have one brain and uh, your brain is probably more important for injury in contact sports than your solitary kidney would be. But anyhow, AAP recommendations, I think, still would say no contact sports. Long term, these patients all should do very well, should be normal. And very few, this is, so multi-cystic dysplastic kidney with incredibly rare exceptions is a unilateral process, generally is not associated with renal insufficiency or renal problems. But you do have a solitary kidney, some would argue uh, to somewhat limit your salt, somewhat limit your protein intake. We certainly don't want to restrict protein in a growing child, but you wouldn't want to overdo protein. Probably not do a bodybuilding protein shake, something like that. Okay, and then I like to bring this up just for fun. Is there a compensatory hypertrophy in um, fetal times? And it's an interesting question. One would think because the placenta modulates uh, renal function and modulates fluid and electrolyte balance in the fetus that there might not be. But in fact, interesting science, there, is, there have been some demonstrations of compensatory hypertrophy in the fetus. Okay.
And this patient, because the initial ultrasound was done on the first day of life and there was prenatal hydro, um, we, did, we repeated one this time at four months and you can see this kidney is very normal. The, already the uh, right multicystic kidney is involuting here. So it's quite common. Sometimes it could take five, 10 years to involute, but you often never see a multicystic dysplastic kidney in an adult. So I'm assuming that most all of them will involute over time. And in the absence of hypertension, I think, um, unfortunately, the pediatric urologist probably never needs to see these patients again. Okay, I wanna switch gears to this patient. This is a 20 month old with febrile UTIs. Some people like to do what's called a top-down approach and get a DMSA scan initially. So if we got this DMSA scan, what would be your diagnosis? Again, put that, uh, type something in the chat box. What would be the diagnosis on this DMSA scan? It doesn't really matter in our institution. This is the right kidney. This is the left kidney, uh, right and left. These are tomograms. Okay, left reflux with renal scarring. I very much agree and very good pickup duplication. So that's, I think that's the point I was trying to make here. So let's go back here. This is the same patient. A couple points about that. Here is the ultrasound of the left kidney. Here is the DMSA of the left kidney. Which one is better at diagnosing uh, scarring, renal scarring? I think it's pretty obvious, right? But the DMSA is far better at diagnosing renal scarring. Um, it's much more sensitive. Ultrasound definitely, if I look at this, here's how thick the upper pole is, how big it is, and how thick the parenchyma is. Here's the lower pole, clearly abnormal in comparison, but it's a subtle finding that some ultrasonographers might miss. But on the DMSA, I think even our nuclear medicine people could find that. Uh, abnormal lower pole. Okay, and then the question is why lower pole scarring? And I think some of you answered that already. Uh, it's because there's reflux to the lower pole. And remember that, and this is a really interesting thing about reflux, and we don't study this much anymore because uh, many people don't believe reflux is an important disease. I think it is in some ways, but in any event, uh, Reflux almost always causes scarring of the upper pole first. Uh, and that's because there's compound calyces in the upper pole, and that's because there's intrarenal reflux in the upper pole of the kidney. And if you go back to the original so-called Big Bang theories, scarring is almost always gonna occur in the upper pole first. If it's occurring in the lower pole first, then you really need to be suspicious of a duplication. So here's the cystogram. And I think you can see this is reflux to the lower pole that's associated with that scarring. So here's another patient. I just want you to see what it looks like with lower pole reflux here. And I show this picture. I think you probably all know what that sign is, but what radiologic sign is that? In this case, with the bilateral lower pole reflux, right. This is a drooping lily sign. Exactly. And this is kind of like a drooping lily of both of these kidneys. But notice the upper, there aren't enough calyces. Notice the axis should be this way. The axis is very up and down. In this case, the axis is actually reversed. It should be in this direction. In this case, it's almost this way. So it's a bad axis, missing upper pole calyces, and the so-called drooping lily sign. Very good. Okay, and um, if you wanna learn about reflux, I think this is probably the classic paper by Ransley, uh, was the main author and did most of the work, Ransley and Risden, and uh, it will explain reflux nephropathy, primary reflux, why they're scarring in the upper pole. It's a great, great reference. Okay, how about these two newborns with um, uh, funky uh, abdominal lesions? So one is a KUB, the other is a BCUG. What diagnosis would you give these? Hey, they both have the same diagnosis. Uh, 
different patients, but the same diagnosis. Exactly. Thank you very much. So this is prune belly, okay? And you can tell this baby's abdomen is so big, it's flopping over and you can barely get the, you can't even get the whole baby on one KUV picture, right? And then the cystogram shows this kind of floppy bladder. And where is this going up here? Anyone want to type that in? Where is that going? Or what is that? All right, that's a uracal diverticulum. Not really patent, so someone put patent. It's not actually, in this case, patent. It could be in some cases of Plum Valley, but this is a uracal diverticulum going up towards the um, uracus. Exactly. So prune belly syndrome, and we don't see it as much anymore, but it's the very distended abdomen with wrinkle because there's very poor abdominal muscle, other synonyms, abdominal muscle deficiency, congenital absence of the muscles, Eagle Barrett syndrome, Obrinsky syndrome, and Triad syndrome are all good names for it. So it's a deficiency of the abdominal wall, usually associated with marked hydronephrosis, but it's an interesting hydronephrosis because it's kind of this plastic muscle in the ureters as well, and intra-abdominal testes. And this is what the cystogram typically looks like. Now, here's the, the point I was trying to make before. This is what a urethral valve cystogram looks like at the end of the prostatic urethra. This is what a prune belly. So it's widened, it's elongated, but it doesn't have the same configuration because at least at the time that we see these patients, there's no obstruction. There's some people who feel that it was a urethral valve very early that unobstructed itself somehow, and you got the residual appearance of that, uh, but that's to this day very hard, if not impossible to prove. So I hope you can see the difference in cystograms between these two conditions. Okay, here's another one that would be interesting. Two-week-old newborn with prenatal hydro. What do you guys think? Someone type in what you think the diagnosis is here. Anyone? So you're saying the kidneys here, again, nice cortical medullary differentiation. Kidneys can be a little bit lumpy. Uh, that's very normal in a newborn kidney, especially if uh, this kid was a couple weeks early, okay? And, but what are you seeing here? Very echogenic medulla, right? Anyone wanna hazard a guess? Same thing, nice cortical medullary differentiation, well-functioning kidneys, but echogenic medulla, what would you call this? Anyone want to take a guess? Nephrocalcinosis, I would agree with that. I think that's a good guess. So we do call it nephrogenic diagnosis due to, in this premature baby, Okay, likely Lasix induced because neonates frequently will are premature, have bronchopulmonary dysplasia, they're frequently put on furosemide. It's very common to do uh, and it's very helpful for their lung function, but it causes hypercalciuria. They're also oftentimes given calcium supplementation. So the combination of giving them lots of calcium, which gets excreted, and then the furosemide on top of it causes this. And the best thing to do, sometimes you can't stop the diuretic because they need it for their lung function. Although by the time we see these kids, it may be that they're over the worst of their lung function. But you can switch them to thiazide diuretics. And that is very helpful. In this case, which we saw, this is the four month follow up, you could see not maybe total resolution, but pretty good resolution of the nephrocalcinosis. And I like to say, these are fascinating because they're the only type of calcium stones that I'm aware of that are dissolvable. So these actually can dissolve and regress uh, if you treat them properly. I've seen some that need to be treated as well <coughs> surgically, but the majority 
if you get them early and you uh, reverse the hypercalciuria, uh, you can get them to regress. Okay, here's an interesting paper if you want a, a reference on hypercalciuria or nephrocalcinosis in children. Interesting thing. Okay, how about this one? Here's an ultrasound of the left kidney um, in a patient with prenatal hydronephrosis. What diagnosis would you give this? Please type it in. Okay, anyone want to type in a diagnosis on this one? Okay, Maggie Yurder is one, ectopic Yurder, upper pole. So I would say a um, couple things. Number one, look at this. So you have very good parenchyma of the lower pole, right? And you have nice cortical medullary differentiation, and you don't see any cortical cysts, and the echogenicity is normal. So you have a very, very healthy lower pole. And then in the upper pole, you have this huge ureter and you can see it's very tortuous coming down, right? So when you see that configuration, this is my rule. You can quote me if you're on taking your oral boards, you can quote me and if they flunk you, you can blame me, but they won't. Because there's only two things this can be, either a ureter seal or an ectopic ureter. So there's only two possibilities. So here is this patient, okay? Lower pole, normal. Upper pole, very, very dilated and tortuous. Here's his cystogram. What do you think on his VCUG? What are we seeing? What do you, if you think it's a ureter seal or an ectopic ureter based on the VCUG? Yeah, no ureter seal, but ectopic. So this is fascinating. <coughs> and this is an important reminder of a rare condition. So I think this is a good one to try and memorize. So this reflux only occurs with voiding. So this ectopic ureter, so this is upper pole reflux. Upper pole reflux happens, but it's rare. And one of the circumstances where you get upper pole reflux is when you have an ectopic ureter. So this is below the bladder neck. It does not reflux until he voids. And then when he voids and fills his urethra, that's when you see reflux into the upper pole. So this is an ectopic ureter with reflux into the ectopic ureter. Here's his DMSA scan. You can decide if it's, they say it's 33% uh, of the right kidney, so 16% of the total function is in that upper pole. And you can decide if you want to save it or not. You could do a upper pole hemi-nephrectomy. You could do a ureterostomy. Oh, I'm telling you the answers. Um, you could do a ureterostomy. You could re-implant it. This is, so normally when you do a re-implant of a duplication, you have to do a common sheath re-implant. But when you have a huge ectopic ureter like this, it probably has a separate sheath. And you could actually, in this rare circumstance, do not make a habit of this and do not quote me on boards for this, but you could e safely reimplant this as a se separate ureter if you really wanted to. So a lot of different options. What would you do with the stump? So this is a classic question in pedurology. Would you leave the stump open or would you tie it off? And we'll want to comment on that. You definitely can't leave it open because it's refluxing. So you have to tie it off. You take it as low as you can and tie it off. Okay, so we're running. Uh, and these are just some other examples of duplications. Here's another one. Lower pole normal, upper pole hydro. You look at the bladder. Now, these babies are very tricky. There's not very, there's about two cc's in the bladder. And there's a the really subtle finding that maybe there's something in the bladder. But when you do the cystogram, you can see the ureter seal, the contrast around it. With voiding, you can see the ureter seal actually extends into the urethra. Uh, very important, you may not be in a great hospital when you finish for pediatric stuff. 
So um, you want to get a very early film, otherwise you might miss it. You can see once there's a lot of contrast in the bladder, it kind of overshadows the filling defect. Very important. Okay, so um, this is my last case. It's a case of an older kid we saw recently with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And I show it because I thought it was fascinating why the hydronephrosis in someone with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Uh, I guess it could be the cause, post-obstructive, but in this case, it was primary nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. We had a normal ultrasound years ago, but this hydro is caused by the huge uh, urine output. This, this patient makes four to five liters of urine a day, and they get large distended bladders, and they have not an obstruction, but a relative obstruction because the ureter can't really take the flow from five liters of urine a day. So really interesting uh, finding in the case of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And the treatment for this, of course, is treat the diabetes insipidus. Okay, so uh, just to review, we did UPJ obstructions, hydrocolpus, posterior valves. These are all cases of abdominal masses, multicystic dysplastic kidney as well. A little bit of reflux nephropathy, duplications, prune belly, neonatal nephrocalcinosis, ectopic ureters, and a little tiny bit of diabetes insipidus. So um, this is our most recent logo at Albany Med, given the COVID crisis. And um, I'm happy, first, yeah, please um, take the survey, tell us what you think. And then secondly, happy to take any questions at this point. So thank you for your attention and thank you for your guesses. It makes it a little more fun for me to do it if you're guessing along. Um, so if there are questions, happy to take them now. Um, Laura, I can't really see. Let's see if I have Q and A. Yep, I don't, I don't think there were any questions in the Q and A during because it was so interactive. People kind of asked nope. and answered has been along. Here you have one from Brent Nose. Um, for the prenatal DI patient, did bladder function improve with diabetes treatment? Uh, yes, but by the time we see these kids, it can be late. So they really need to be on timed voiding. And this is a really interesting time. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, overnight bladder emptying, but these kids, just like some valve patients, do really well with placing a catheter overnight because they may make, during the day, they, uh, they might be able to void every hour or so when they need to, but at night, they're clearly not going to do that. So sometimes place, and they don't respond to DDAVP, of course, if they have DI. Um, so sometimes placing a catheter overnight allows them to drain two liters of urine overnight while they're sleeping and still be good. Many of them are not willing to place a catheter normally. So sometimes we've done actually a metropanoff, an abdominal catheterizable stoma for that. Good question, thank you. Other things? <clears throat> Okay, I think I don't know where my time is. I'm yeah, I think that was everything. We're just about at 10 after, but thanks very much, Dr. Kogan. Okay, well, thank you very much for paying attention. Please do the survey, and I appreciate your participation. So thanks very much.